I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, Thank good you. and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. Welcome to the Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm Dean Detloff. I'm a PhD student at the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto. And I'm Matt Bernico. I teach media studies at Greenville University in Greenville, Illinois. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of cool stuff, but before we do that, uh, just a quick update about the Friendly Fire Collective and Christians for Socialism in Philadelphia that is worth making people aware of. So we talked to Haesung a long time ago, and then also Catherine from Friendly Anarchism about the Friendly Fire Collective, so learn more about them there uh, in those episodes. But uh, right now, they're occupying uh, ICE in Philadelphia, so you know they've you can find out all the stuff on their blog, and, and you should at, the friend, at friendlyfirecollective.wordpress.com. But the short of it is, uh, they started occupying outside of ICE uh, in a detention center, and then they got moved to the city hall there. And they've been trying to really sort of force the mayor's hand on some uh, issues related to them being a sanctuary city and some policies that are not um, reflective of that. And they scored a, a major victory um, just recently, uh, but the fight is not over and uh, they're raising some more money. And there's a Venmo that you can donate to, which you can find out on the Christians for Socialism website at christiansforsocialism.org. Uh, so we're not going to spend a whole episode on that, but uh, just something that I think is really important, especially as uh, the Christian left gets built uh, in the U.S. and Canada and elsewhere, uh, that we kind of keep reminding ourselves that there are people like putting their bodies and lives uh, on the line, and we have lots of ways that we can support them. Uh, this week, we are going to talk about this wild communist pastor, or pastor turned communist, uh, however you want to put it, uh, this guy named Albert Edward Smith, A.E. Smith, extremely average name, but extremely uh, extraordinary guy. <laughs> um, but before that, uh, Matt, what are you up to this week? Man, so so much stuff. My child was sick, so I was catching his barf. In, Ugh, uh, so good. Uh, yeah. You know, it's like uh, gross. Barf, barf is gross. Uh, but like with your little kid, it's totally fine. You can just kind of pull through <laughs> and do it. Is the That's the life lesson I learned this week. Um, there you go. I also learned uh, a little bit about uh, what hell is like because uh, the only cartoon he wanted to watch was uh, Garfield. So. Ooh, yikes. Is it? But it's like the new, the CGI Garfield. It's a CGI Garfield. Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> yeah i've seen exactly one episode of that show at your house oh good <laughs> it, i mean it is a bad tv show but the one thing that i like about it is the guy who voices the cgi garfield is just doing the worst impression of uh yeah uh, uh bill, bill murray yeah bill murray um which is great i think that that's just sort of like a nice subtle joke for the adults yeah it is uh we all get it we're all in on the joke <laughs> um so that happened and it wasn't really cool um kind of a bad time but then uh he got better and uh yeah um my uh my awful rotten no good terrible week though turned around uh when something really miraculous happened though uh oh, dean are you, are you familiar with the uh the artist known as john mcnaughton you know i, I am and I, I only am because i am a a consumer of very fine arts so that's how i'm <laughs> familiar with him right you've been to a museum you've seen it there probably i've been to a museum i've read a few books i've taken some classes in aesthetics uh so i know a thing or two about john mcnaughton mcnaughton yeah. 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think that's actually how you pronounce his name. Uh, well, for all of you out there who don't know uh, of the uh, the artist and luminary John McNaughton, he is, according to his website, an established artist from Utah whose new paintings have attracted the international attention of millions over the past few years. Uh, about his paintings, John McNaughton says, I prefer to paint pictures that I believe have relevance to what's going on in the world, <laughs> that make a statement, that stand for something. I hope people will study the paintings and try to understand the deeper meaning. Uh, so, yeah, he's a great artist. He, he paints things that are really political, uh, things that have to do with uh, the main themes of the show, uh, politics and religion. Anyways, he had uh, two two new paintings come out recently, and uh, let's just talk about them really quick. If you guys aren't really familiar with John McNaughton, uh, we'll make sure we tweet uh, his images uh, uh, copiously in the next few days. Um, also, just go ahead and uh, pull your phone out, get to the get to the Google uh, or the or DuckDuckGo or Lycos or Dogpile, and just Google <laughs> uh, John McNaughton, and you'll see all of his good paintings. Anyways, uh, he had one that came out this week. I feel like a, I think Dogpile is probably the most appropriate browser just by virtue of its name, really. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, only 90s kids will get that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, uh, his new painting is called Crossing the Swamp. Um, so uh, let me just describe this painting as good as I possibly can. Uh, Dean, feel free to jump in if I miss any of the really important details. Yeah, uh, you know I will. I, I have been studying this painting a lot at John's uh, personal request. Yeah, so uh, all of you listeners uh, from the United States will probably be familiar with a really famous historical painting called uh, Washington Crossing the Delaware. Uh, It's a famous painting featuring George Washington in a boat crossing like a river. It's important to people. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, this is a a painting called Crossing the Swamp, which features Donald Trump in his uh, sort of presidential administration his uh, cadre if you will yeah that's right his cadre uh they're in a boat they're crossing a swamp in front of the state capitol um and all of all of the good guys and gals are there uh we got nikki haley james mattis ben carson donald j trump himself jeff sessions mike pence melania trump all of them they're all there john bolton is there he's got a big floppy hat on so that's uh, how you know it's uh especially recent <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because he he just bought the hat like last week. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's how you know the painting is recent, uh, just by virtue of like uh, who's actually in the administration this month. Oh yeah, good point. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Sarah Sanders is there, so you know, cool. All all our friends, all of our cool, uh, cool, great political friends are in this. Anyway, so it's kind of uh, supposed to signal. Uh, I mean, so uh, John McNaughton wants us to think through the deeper meanings of his paintings. Uh, Dean, uh, being an astute observer of art and uh, person who knows about aesthetics, what is the deeper meaning of this painting? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are so many. There are, like with any great artist, there are just layers and layers of meaning. Uh, the kind of layers you just have to peel back and the smellier they get, like an onion, uh, <laughs> not like a parfait. Not and, like Shrek. Uh, no, not at all. And I think... Um, you know, when, when I see this painting, just the first sort of thing that strikes me about it is uh, the color palette, uh, which reminds me of another just great uh, work of art um, or series of works of art, if you think about it, Te- like probably millions of works of art. And that is uh, all the cells of the Scooby-Doo series. Yeah, it is ex- uh, just, exactly that color palette, huh? Yeah, very Scooby-Doo. Um, the, you could you could put this background in Scooby-Doo and just have the mystery machine like drive right over this uh the swamp of gators and uh, you wouldn't miss a beat. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, uh I think that sounds about like that sounds like a deeper meaning to me. Uh John McNaughton says uh, about uh in the description of this painting, uh he says that Trump endeavors to cross the quote swamp of Washington DC as he carries the light of truth, hope and prosperity. The murky water of the deep state is laced with <laughs> with dangerous vermin <laughs> perfectly willing to de- perfectly willing to destroy american prosperity for their personal ideologies and financial gain the establishment democrats never trump or republicans deep state and fake news media will do all they can to stop the majority of the american people from succeeding <laughs> uh john mcnaughton concludes his description saying as an artist i paint what i feel needs to be said about the current state of our country <laughs> <laughs> so uh and then uh he uh sorry the last thing he says is i want to be on that boat for freedom 
Yeah, it's a real missed opportunity because he could have just painted himself onto it. I he know didn't. he the the artist, uh, as we all know, uh, should always paint themselves directly into their paintings. <laughs> I mean, it's just the truth. Uh, if you if you really think about it, John McNaughton is on this boat in his own way, just crossing the swamp, uh, taking care of these vermin. Um, I do want to just point out, I mean, among all these just wonderfully rendered, uh, you know, almost photographic uh, images of people, um, my favorite one is John Bolton. He uh, is so good. Is just, just depicted on the end of the boat, apparently contemplating how he's going to go to the bathroom, uh, holding the shotgun, looking extremely Duck Dynasty in this uh, this good bucket, bucket cap. Uh, just definitely my favorite character on the entire boat. Yeah, uh, John Bolton in a bucket hat with a gun and camo on the back of a, a freedom boat in the swamp is so good. Like, I yeah, don't I think, think so. I would wager to guess that mm, John Bolton's probably never actually worn a bucket hat in real life. But <laughs> after this painting, I think he might reconsider it because it looks good on him. It's a good look. It really brings it the sort of like uh, crazy, crazy old man on a porch telling you to get off his lawn. Look, it pulls it all together for him. Yeah, there is a lot of tinfoil inside of that hat, for sure. <laughs> Lined with tinfoil in there. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, that's, how, that's how you get rid of the vermin. They can't get you if you got that tinfoil. <laughs> that's right. They can't get in into your brain. Well, uh, this has been a new segment on the Magnificast called uh, We Describe a Bad Picture to You. Not uh, <laughs> not great for the audio medium, but I'm just, it's good, though. It's It's a great painting. It's a great painting. Uh, look, I, look. I've already ordered a print. I, I don't know. We're going to make some stickers. Who, who could say uh, what this spells for the future of the Magnificast? Uh, it is actually really important for me to tell everyone this right now, too. If you go to John McNaughton's website, there is a little thing uh, where you can uh, sign up with your email. So uh, maybe make one up. And uh, you can download a free John McNaughton ebook. And I have just received it in my email. And let me tell you, it is so good. What's in it? What is it? <laughs> it's just like, uh, well, it talks a lot about his walk with Jesus, a lot about his mm-hmm. sort of biography. God speaks to us in dreams through other people and even through paintings, says John McNaughton. It has some uh, sort of big uh, images of some of his more famous paintings. Um, you might re- you might recognize uh, one of his most famous paintings, I think, is called One Nation Under God. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's really good uh, in a way. It's a, a picture of Jesus holding the Constitution and then all of the all of the presidents ever of United States history are standing behind him. Uh, and uh, then there's also like um, like an abortion doctor who's like crying in the front. And uh, is Obama there? Uh, no, there is an Obama painting, mm. though. Uh, I don't remember what it's called off the top of my head. Shoot. But it is a picture of Obama like like ripping up the Constitution or something uh, yeah, yeah. and uh like all the other presidents are like what are you doing there's, <laughs> there's a treasure map on the back of that thing <laughs> yeah that's right richard nixon is uh really worried about it i'm sure uh, exactly yeah oh there's another one too where there's like uh there's like sort of a a joe six-pack type character holding up the constitution and um <laughs> people around like there are other presidents around him sort of praising him for doing so but obama is in the front row like with his hands up saying like no it's my greatest weakness <laughs> <laughs> well that's just uh just telling the truth telling it like it is yeah so exactly like it is uh john mcnaughton has also just so much to say uh so anyways get his free ebook engage his paintings he is a prolific author <laughs> he's a prolific painter a voice of our generation uh you gotta just check it out so oh my gosh uh okay hold the phone because so there's a drop down menu on this website for patriotic and uh within that is another drop down menu for conservative drawings and there are two (laughs) categories one for john Uh, kennedy (laughs) and one for kim jong-un yeah the great conservative king (laughs) jong-un uh anyway okay well that's good um John, get at us. Uh, I don't know. Send us some free samples. Uh, John, just want to know the truth, you know. Come under the Magnificast. Oh, there's a political a political painting called "One Nation Under Socialism," 
And oh, oh no way. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, okay. Let me just quickly describe it to you. I'm sorry. We we'll, we won't spend more than this time on it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it is a picture of Obama with a sort of mad face on, holding the Constitution. Ah. And, but the Constitution is on fire, and he's pointing to the fire as if to say, look, this is what I've done, and now socialism is real. <laughs> oh, wow. He, so I guess he's, like, mad mad that uh, socialism has or hasn't really happened. I, you see, this is the thing about deeper meanings. Uh, depending on just how you're viewing this painting, imagine if you saw this painting with that title completely decontextualized, <laughs> just in, like, a white room in a gallery. What would you make of it? Uh, I feel like that's a good, like, Rorschach test. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, in the in the description, uh, oh my gosh, it is a lot to take in. Uh, John Naughton <laughs> says, "I will not support an ideology which l- will lead to the destruction of America. In the history of the world, never has there been a recorded example where socialism has led to the betterment of human condition or improved the liberty of people." <laughs> uh, well, you know, we always have bad transitions on this podcast, but actually, that is a great, fantastic segue into uh, <laughs> learning about A.E. Smith, Albert Edward Smith, a guy who did not uh, have the same feeling <laughs> about socialism uh, and instead ended up uh, supporting it as a the, the last hope for human beings um, and something that could actually work. Uh, so... Let's get into that a bit. Um, I guess I should maybe preface this saying um, the reason we're talking about this guy uh, for, well, a couple of reasons. One is that I live in Canada, and I've been thinking a lot about Christianity and the left here, trying to understand it, because I'm not from this country. And I was reading lots and lots of stuff about Christianity and the origins of the New Democratic Party, which is the Social Democrat Party here in Canada. is kind of like a left wing within it that you know has a certain democratic social spin is it's like the bernie sanders party uh and it's interesting it's why there's like social health socialized uh health care here in canada so good for them um but i you know i kept thinking there's got to be somewhere in history uh in canada some maybe more radical christians a little to the left of that And lo and behold, I found this uh, amazing story of this guy, Albert Edward Smith. Um, There's a couple of really good articles about him, and he also wrote an autobiography. And uh, yeah, he ended up being a member of the Communist Party of Canada. So people in the party know who he is. And I've chatted with a couple of folks who, uh, (laughs) whenever I've mentioned that I am a Christian and, you know, interested in, in the party or whatever, they're always like, oh. Do you know about this guy, Albert Edward Smith? He was a Christian interested in the party once, too. <laughs> uh, so I was like, yeah, I've heard of him. So we read a couple of really good articles about him. Uh, and we can put those articles in the description. Um, but yeah, just going to maybe talk through a bit of his life and make some connections and uh, jump off of some stuff. So uh, at the risk of not saying too much right away, I'll ask you, Matt, to introduce maybe a little bit of uh, Smith and what he's about and what you might have found to be really cool about him. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff about him. I think that this is a really great riff off of the last few episodes we've been doing anyways, uh, in the sense that we've been talking about the, you know, sort of um, medieval Christians who engage with a pre-Marxist type of communism and then we talked about how cool Marx is last week. And now we kind of get to see a Christian who embodies, I think, both of those things, um, both how good mm-hmm. Marx is and the um, that socialist uh, and communist impulse within Christianity in general. Um, so this guy, uh, Albert Edward Smith, I think we can think of him um, as someone who brings a lot of these ideas together in their biography. We also spend a lot of time on this podcast like talking about historical figures, like people you know, that play a minor role in history, but are actually kind of important to the narrative of the Christian left. And uh, I think that this is just like one more person that we can add to our, uh, our collection of uh, Christian <laughs> leftists. The trading cards. Yeah. I mean, again, it's just like, um, it's just like one more person to kind of put up on your, uh, the, the shelf of your brain for when someone says, you can't be a Christian and a communist. You can say, well, Albert Edward Smith was, and uh, yeah, So he's cool for those reasons. So, uh, okay, basic life details. He was alive between the years 1871 and 1947. He was Canadian. He was a minister in the Methodist church. So uh, shout out to my Methodist people out there. Thank you for one person being good. Um, (laughs) 
uh, Methodism, uh, you know, um, as they still are not, uh, they're not super into communism. Uh, so he ended up leaving, uh, the Methodist church, um, not by his choice, actually, they kind of forced him out in a certain way. Um, and when they did, he started something called the People's Church, which was a, yeah, a leftist kind of Christian church that paid attention to these, um, I don't know what they called it, the social gospel, which is kind of a loaded term for this day and age, but um, we'll get into it in a bit. Um, Post People's Church, he went out to like plant more people's churches around Canada, and he did for a bit. Um, as he did that, though, he ended up in Toronto, and he ended up moving further left yet, uh, becoming a full-fledged communist, kind of leaving some of his Christianity behind, or that's kind of what we assume because no one really talks about that part very much. Uh, but he joins the Communist Party of Canada and uh, is a politician and runs in some elections and doesn't do so bad. So Albert Edward Smith is a person who starts off as sort of an evangelical Christian and then throughout his life just like moves further and further left until he becomes a communist. And um, that's just where he ends up at the end of his life, at the end of his like journey as a person. And it's a cool story. Does that sound good, Dean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I think, too, all these kinds of tensions that he has both within the church and within the labor movement are really interesting to kind of track, and we'll try to pull that out as we go. Uh, I love it so much because he is just, like, a diehard uh, committer um, in, like, every respect. Uh, like, for example, his run-ins with the Methodists um, in, in the beginning which we'll talk about in a minute as well. Uh, what I what I think is so cool about it is he doesn't actually want to leave uh, Methodism as sort of his denomination or whatever. And in fact, even when he starts the People's Church, like he's still technically considered a Methodist pastor. <laughs> like he's still fine, like cleared on the board or whatever. Um, and it takes like a really long time ultimately for him to end up, uh, you know, out of that uh, ministry, I guess. But yeah, interesting dude. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, so let's ease our way in here. Uh, so early on, um, he gets assigned to this church in a place called Brandon, Manitoba. And he's hanging out there for a while, and he's involved in some kind of workers' issues, but mostly just sort of like learning, basically. So in his early uh, preaching assignment, he kind of recognizes how the working class is alienated from like the life of the church itself. And... If you want to learn a little bit more about that, maybe go back and listen to the episode we did with Heath Carter, uh, where he talked about his book Union Made, which talks about Chicago in particular. But I think many of the dynamics he identifies there are also present in Brandon. So there's a real rift between sort of working class daily life and then what happens in church on Sunday. So as a pastor, Smith is kind of noticing that rift and he's like not content with it. Um, many other pastors are and were, uh, but he sort of sees a problem there. And uh, so he kind of notices that like evangelicalism has this uh, this emphasis on personal salvation, but he, you know he puts two and to get two and two together and seems to find that that narrative doesn't really connect uh, with these economic forces that are exploiting the families that are in his church. Uh, so there's something sort of like tone deaf, I guess, about uh, promoting that you know otherworldly reward while people are suffering in his very congregation. Yeah, um, I can really relate to this early biography of him. I can relate to his entire biography, honestly. I mean, a Christian starting off as an evangelical <laughs> and then becoming a communist is exactly me. So it's very cool. Um, anyways, it's just like, uh, it's kind of nice to find yourself in the biography of another person. It's kind of a helpful way to situate yourself. Um, again, when, I, I mean, you know, we've talked about this a thousand times, but being like a Christian on the left means being pretty lonely in most situations so just finding mm -hmm. these other sort of historical resonances is cool um and especially those methods too that's fun uh, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. uh but that that like realization that like maybe personal salvation is not the most important thing in some of these situations um is a feeling i know i've definitely had in church um <laughs> when people have been <laughs> talking like oh, about how important it is to get missionaries out there it's like well maybe there are other sort of bigger things at work uh, that we ought to th that think about before that. But evangelicalism is uh, something that does like limits the way you think about uh, economic forces for sure. So uh, anyways, it's a, it's a cool thing to see and that you can identify with. Um, well, on that point, I guess like elaborating on uh, 
elaborating on Albert, uh, Edward Smith's um, observations uh, sort of during his shift from evangelicalism to like the social gospel. Uh, he says some cool stuff, and uh, this is what he says. I saw the kingdom of God as a social order to be established among people, and the mission of the church was to seek this objective as the sole purpose of its existence. I rediscovered the person and message of Jesus. The textbook of his words became a new world of truth to me. He was not so much concerned about the salvation of people as he was about the salvation of their societal relations. He was trying to get right living conditions set up among the people of this world. So, I mean, I think what we see here is like that that early shift, that early re-understanding of uh, Jesus as um, someone who actually might care about the, quote, living conditions that are set up in this world. Um, I don't know, Dean, what do you think about this first thing that he says? Yeah, I think it's a really fascinating observation to have a pastor make. Um, I mean, this is the kind of thing that I think communists are always insisting on, which is basically that it is the material conditions that prompt people to second guess what's going on. And even in this case, to second guess what your religion, religious tradition says, not insofar as he feels compelled to abandon his faith, but rather it kind of gives this new dimension, right? It reveals something um, about what uh, Jesus's ministry was and what it could be in Manitoba or uh, in you know his church. And I think there's a lot of interesting stuff about it. I mean, we, you know, we talk about the social gospel uh, a lot, especially in the U.S. and Canada, because it's like a big cultural force and a big deal. Um, But what's interesting about Smith is he really starts, I think, already at this point to signal that he is on like the left side of that social gospel movement. Right. So it's not it's not just about like seeking justice in the world or uh, like what would Jesus do? Um, it's actually putting a little bit more content behind that. It's like, well, uh, what Jesus would do is bring like a, a real sort of salvific transformation of how people live together. And even that note about uh, he was trying to get right uh, living conditions set up. Like that's a pretty amazing, uh, you know, not not wildly intricate claim, but a very important uh, bedrock for thinking about, well, what are wrong living conditions? What would right living conditions look like? Um, and to have a pastor think about those things, I think, is really, really important. To have a pastor who's in touch with the people and motivated by their concerns and then trying to retranslate that back into his responsibility as someone who is, you know, expected to help people understand what Jesus is doing in the world. I think that's just a really neat, uh, cool reflection on his part. Yeah, to me, the insistence on the right living conditions rather than the salvation of souls is kind of an important point. And I think this highlights the sort of like his, you know, it highlights a place in his progression. Um, but to to me, it's like helpful, a helpful way to kind of place him in the conversation of the social gospel and set him up as, yeah, different, right? Um, I was having a conversation with my, uh, my pastor earlier today. And um, okay, so... I've said this before on the podcast, so it's fine. Um, I'm on like the, <laughs> I'm like on the mission committee at my church. It's like a, it's like one of those situations I just completely like walked into and like, they're like, you know, they just told me to do it. So I did. And uh, I was trying to explain to her like why I was uncomfortable with giving money to like people spreading the gospel in other countries or whatever. Cause you know, it, mm-hmm. it's like colonialist or imperialist or like white supremacist or whatever. Um, all of those things probably. Anyways, uh, she said, Oh, so you're more interested in like, justice oriented giving and i'm like well i want to improve the material conditions of people's lives i said that because i'm a i'm like a marxist so like yeah (laughs) but like that was like you know that was her shorthand way of kind of referring to it you want to work for justice and like you know no fault to her she that's just the way she talks and it's fine but like there's a difference between like wanting to work for justice vaguely and wanting to actually improve people's material conditions or something. So it's yeah, an important thing to yeah. point out. It's like there, uh, there's a spectrum of social gospelness, and uh, we're finding where he's at on it. Yeah, I think that's true. Also, uh, that point you're just making about just how justice functions as a weird way of mystifying what people actually mean. Because uh, yeah. if someone just asks you like flat out, Hey, do you want justice in the world? It's like, well, like I mean, hell yeah. yeah. Like who like literally who doesn't? Yeah. <laughs> like who wouldn't say that, right? Uh but the way that you want that justice to look or how you think that it should look or whatever makes all the difference. It's a difference that makes a difference. 
Right. Uh, I mean, justice in the way that we're talking about right here and the evangelical discourse is exactly what Daryl uh, Vonzo Serrano was talking about a few weeks ago in terms of like the yeah. ideograph, right? It's like a word that means a lot of things, but nothing precise in the conversation, you know? So like right. when I say justice, I mean like mm, abolishing prisons. And uh, <laughs> when my pastor says justice, she means like, I don't know, something good, but like not that probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not the same as all. Uh, all right, so let's uh, think a little bit about what it means for this pastor uh, to say what he's saying. Um, I think it's pretty interesting because the general thrust that you get is, okay, he's assigned to this church. He gets up, he's feeling a little bit convicted, and he starts preaching about these uh, you know, ways of understanding social problems. And it's really ad hoc. Like, I think you get the impression that a lot of it is, you know, trying to pay attention to the language in the air and also using Christian language to spin that out. But there's no like super systematic organization of those thoughts quite yet. Uh, But nevertheless, his parishioners are like not into it (laughs) at first. Uh, So they just like got this crazy pastor, right, who starts talking about all this weird stuff. And uh, that will ramp up um, shortly. But I think it's pretty interesting to kind of just reflect on that, right? Like, it's not like he got up, preached that, you know, Jesus is about changing social conditions. And everyone said, yeah, that's great. That's exactly what we should do, right? He, like, met with a lot of challenges. Yeah, exactly. Uh, It is a theme in his life for the Christians that he is the pastor of to be mad at him about it. (laughs) Uh, uh, One article uh, kind of. Uh, talking about the reaction that the elders of his church had uh, noted that they uh, had no deep concern for the poor, no deep sense of responsibility. Uh, they could plan the extension of business, but uh, but they had no social sense. So they're not thrilled about it, right? Like, again, this is the exact same thing that would happen probably if most of us stood up in our churches and we're like, uh, hey, what if we, um, I mean, the gospel's great and all, but what if we, uh, you know, use the gospel to make people's lives better materially? I think people would be like, mm, but what about their souls, though? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that about a thousand times, for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, anyways, uh, it uh, this is a theme throughout his life. It keeps happening. And I think every time it does happen, uh, what I really like about it is A.E. Smith is never like, yeah, maybe I should think about that. He's always just like doubles down on it. Um, it's like, <laughs> yeah. So he just becomes like more, like more communist every single time someone shuts him down. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he does have this real kind of prophetic thread that just seems to keep forcing him a little bit further left every time he gets uh, that kind of opposition. I yeah, I don't want to do like a you know a psychoanalysis of evangelicalism, but I think there's something in evangelicalism that makes us this way. Like mm. someone telling you you're wrong and then you double down on that thing that you're that you're supposed <laughs> to be wrong about. That's something that is a particularly Christian move, I think. That's true. I think you're right. Uh, yeah. Not listening to anybody and just saying, no, I'm right is <laughs> something there. Well, maybe we'll figure it out someday, but it's a Christian thing to do. Yeah, I agree with you. And also, my partner, Emily, will definitely agree with you. (laughs) It's probably like, it's probably a very male Christian thing to do, though, too, you know? Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yep, well, let's uh, work that out with our therapist later. Um, So the the narrative here um, that we get is, you know, his prisoners aren't into this, uh, this whole deal. And... Uh, Smith responds to that by moving further left left, and he starts hanging out with socialists and that decision to spend some more time with socialists and significant time with people in the labor movement starts to unsurprisingly make him more and more committed to worker struggles and builds more and more tensions with his uh, with the people in his congregation Um, and they end up bringing that to their uh, local Methodist board. And the decision is basically to just move him to a different church and see how that goes. Uh, But as you can expect, it also doesn't go super well. (laughs) Um, And it's even larger. The church is bigger. So there are more people who are upset about it. Um, But all this really kind of comes to a head uh, in 1919, um, in June, when uh, his congregants start voicing these concerns about Smith's involvement in uh, the Winnipeg general strike which is a really important thing in Canadian labor history. Uh, 
it's i mean it is a massive gigantic work stoppage and you know it happens two years after the bolshevik revolution and uh, it freaks a lot of people out and to this day it's like a big moment uh in in all in both uh canada and the u.s in fact it's like a really big kind of um motivating drive for the labor movement and they uh so smith doesn't live in uh winnipeg he lives in in brandon uh but in brandon he starts saying that like christians there should be supporting the strike and as you might suspect people are not excited about that (laughs) (laughs) nope they are not um so the tensions i mean just like in the last church uh the tensions build um and uh it becomes just a pretty big situation in A.E. Smith's life. In one of the articles uh, that we read about him, it references one of his memoirs, and he talks about like his, sort of his mental state during this time, and he was just having a really hard time figuring out what he had to do. What it came down to was like he was going to have to kind of choose a side. He'd have to either stick with his church and maybe chill out a minute about striking, uh, or he'd just have to join the strikers. And uh, I, I mean, I completely believe it was a hard decision to make because like uh you know being a pastor at a big church is i guess kind of the dream right but he chose right i think and he chose just to (laughs) strike side of the strikers kind of a cool story actually comes out of this he uh the article kind of talks about how this went down basically he uh resigned from the church gave his last sermon to the methodist congregation and then like after that he just went to go be with the strikers in like this park that they were meeting in And uh, while he was there, he gave a speech. And during the speech, he announced that he was going to start what he called a people's church. He wanted to start the people's church in Brandon, Manitoba. And guess what? He did. Surprisingly, (laughs) (laughs) it was uh, it just happened, I guess. Uh, You know, it didn't really. They planned it and everything. But surprisingly, it was like actually really popular. I guess it's surprising to me because, you know, the reception now would be very negative. The article mentions several times that, like, every time they met, it was just a full house. They said, like, you know, at the first organizing meeting, there were 200 people there. They elected a committee of 21 people um, for the People's Church. And uh, those 21 people articulated the mission of the People's Church as fearlessly propounding the gospel of social Christianity. Uh, So, pretty straightforward. Um, (laughs) They were going to... Go change the uh, living conditions of people in the world and maybe save their souls in the process. Yeah, I think what's really great about this story, uh, to refer back again to Heath Carter's work, is it really puts on display that it's not the case that during the kind of height of the social gospel movement, there were just a bunch of pastors out there telling people what to do. And then people got the hint and, you know, they started to care about justice. Instead, it was sort of the other way around. Uh, people were doing a bunch of stuff and demanding justice, like fair wages and fair pay and time off and not having to, you know, work in like brutal uh, conditions. And it was some pastors who started to hear that a little bit and uh, also some pastors who were threatened by it, like materially. Uh, and I think what's great is somebody like Smith kind of represents the like the di- dialectical resolution of those two sides, right? Like... Uh, he goes to the strikers and he's like, well, uh, I just left my other church. Do you guys want to start one? (laughs) Like, yeah, I guess so. So they build a church out of the workers movement. Um, and that's like a really kind of amazing, um, maybe like, uh, like peak sort of social gospel moment at at its very best. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. In Heath Carter's book, we saw a strike from church, uh, to kind of get the pastors to listen and uh, here we just see a pastor s- strike in from church to go find people who will <laughs> listen to him. Um, yeah, what a cool thing. What a cool and scary thing to do. Um, yeah. It is worth noting, too, that during the time he was uh, establishing the People's Church, he uh, tried to maintain his spot in the Methodist denomination. Uh, so Methodism, uh, okay, so Methodism is a Protestant denomination in Christianity. Like, you probably know that. But if you don't, there you go. So it's not Catholic. uh, But uh, (laughs) it's, like, fine. If you don't know, it's still okay. Uh, But it does have, like, a really strong hierarchy. Like, historically, the Methodist Church has a hierarchy. The, uh, you know, there are people, there are, like, bishops. And the bishops tell you where you're going to go and do church at if you're a pastor. So that's why he got moved around all those places. Uh, but uh, during this time of the People's Church, he was churchless because he had just resigned. So, like, um, he, he would have either had to be placed somewhere else 
or the Methodist church would have had to say like, nope, you can just kind of be a free agent for a little bit. Free agent is, I believe, a baseball term, not a religious term, but uh, just throwing <laughs> that out there. Uh, anyway, Smith decided that he wanted to try to be like sort of this like free agent pastor and do his own people's church thing while still being a Methodist. And uh, he had to try to convince them of that. And they said, I don't think so. And then he's just like, all right, well, peace out. <laughs> That was how that <laughs> ended. So sort of like a really anticlimactic bureaucratic forcing out of his denomination. But that's the way it worked out. Yeah, though he did uh, maintain like pretty close relationships with uh, Methodists, um, even when he moved to Toronto, like, uh, you know, giving sort of testimony before those boards and stuff. Pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah, for sure. I would be so spiteful were I him. So he's <laughs> a little bit better than me. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> better than me that's for sure uh so maybe one other thing that we can slowly start kind of moving a little forward uh there's a great uh little excerpt in one of these articles of something that he had um articulated uh in a um i don't know if it's like a sermon or what the article doesn't really say but anyway it's what he says and he says uh at the people's church jesus was a deeply convinced and well-informed leader of the communist order of thinkers and teachers that had been extant for many ages in the hebrew race and included such uh, men as moses elijah isaiah jeremiah john the baptist and the early church until it was perverted by the individualistic theologian and politician uh and he goes on to say you know it's capitalism that sort of forced christianity into that uh kind of an idealistic read but nevertheless <laughs> the driving force is that uh you know jesus was a communist which i think is really interesting because he himself was not a communist at this stage um he's still a, a you know reformist kind of socialist character uh so that's the flavor at least of the kind of things that were being talked about at the people's church yeah exactly uh i think this rhetoric is not you know too terribly surprising given like the the last few weeks of conversation uh on the magnificast um we've located the early church in that sort of uh you know communist trajectory and he's just mapping these other folks in the bible onto it as well that isn't super surprising that makes sense even i think um yeah. so uh like we said this sort of, a, a theme in his life is that uh you know something happens and he moves further leftward someone something else happens and that kind of like leftward move is cemented um and after the people's church that same thing keeps happening um so uh smith uh after after establishing the people's church uh became even cooler because he read the communist manifesto that's how you get cool <laughs> you read the read the manifesto they give you a leather jacket right after you read it <laughs> yeah exactly hey uh <laughs> So after reading the manifesto, he kind of says uh, to the People's Church, this is actually, uh, it is from a, uh, I guess like a sermon. Uh, so let's see. It says that uh, he, uh, Smith, argued that Jesus had laid the foundation of society based on fraternity, not on property. But because of human selfishness, this fraternal standard could not be implemented until it was crystallized into a determined course of action. There must be found, he explained, a class that will identify itself with this ideal, not only because of its character, but also because of their own hope, for bread and butter depend on its victory. Uh, that class, for Smith, was the proletariat, as you might expect in the midst of a literal people's church, a church interested in these uh, issues of labor. Um, Smith picks up the manifesto and connects Jesus with the communist thinkers and uh, makes a connection between... Um, like, you know, the idea of Christian hope and the overcoming of uh, class warfare. Uh, so we, we see these ideas um, kind of start off in his social gospel days and then begin crystallizing as he kind of moves towards the left. So he starts uh, planting a bunch of other people's churches after this transformation and uh, pretty successful, it seems like, uh, by all accounts, like just going around the country, starting them up. Uh, but in 1923, he sort of stops that itinerant life and moves to Toronto, uh, where he was invited to be the pastor of a labor church there. And uh, so he turns that church into a people's church. And that is a really transformative place and time for him. Uh, and I think what's really interesting, though, to note is that on his arrival, there are two groups who hear that he's coming and they're both suspicious of him, though for different reasons. So one is the RCMP, the police, the cops, and uh, they get his file from the cops in Brandon. So 
just a warning, this crazy pastor is going to come and stir up some trouble in Toronto. Uh, and also, uh, the Communist Party uh, is aware that he's coming because he's kind of a, like, he's a, not a star, but like a known figure in the labor movement. Um, he had run for office a few times in Brandon before this. Uh, and the Communist Party is also suspicious of him coming because they're critical of his incrementalism. So they don't want to see a kind of gradualist uh, reforming voice uh, that becomes really powerful in the labor movement. Uh, so that's like a really interesting thing, I think. You know, it gives you a sense of where he's at in this ideological change and uh, also how he's both sort of a threat to the state uh, and also in some ways to a revolutionary labor movement. So it's a really like pivotal kind of conversion moment that will happen in toronto yeah cool um the communist party though uh wouldn't have to remain skeptical for long about him um but the police <laughs> probably still did um, uh so a few minutes ago dean you mentioned that he did like you know testify before like the uh ministerial association uh the methodist ministerial association in toronto uh, and, uh, when he was in Toronto, he said some pretty cool things to them that again, I think take some guts. <laughs> um, so, uh, let's see, uh, on February 18th, 1924, in an address to the Toronto Methodist Ministerial Association, Smith explained in relation to his growing involvement in the ranks of labor that he found quote, deeper spiritual and religious satisfaction in this most vital and penetrating movement that I had. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> he had found deeper spiritual and religious satisfaction in the most vital and penetrating movement than I have had anywhere in my life before. So, um, becoming, uh, becoming a communist is more religiously, uh, religiously satisfying and deep, more deeply spiritual than, uh, being a Methodist pastor. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Yeah. Uh, Pretty amazing. It is. I mean, it's, it's not, Unlike what we've heard from other people on this show. I mean, like, uh, in the introduction to the Magnificast, uh, Dean, you edited in all those, like, great quotes from people who've been on the show. And I think it's uh, Catherine from Friendly Anarchism that says, like, you know, as she became more of an anarchist, like, she feels like she's more of a Christian and kind of vice versa. Right. And I think it's the same kind of idea. Like, the more sort of involved he was in material struggles with people, uh, the more kind of, like, you know, religious satisfaction he felt. I can, yeah. I can get that. Definitely. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that uh, that conversion moment, I guess, or, or period. Uh, so he gets to Toronto in 1923. Communists are suspicious of him, but they also go out of their way to get to know him because he like is important and he's also a good organizer and, uh, you know, communists are smart. Um, so they recognize that and they start talking with him and he is really open to what they're doing. And it's pretty fascinating. His son actually had like already joined the Young Communist League. And one of the articles that we read said that uh, it seems like Smith sort of encouraged him to do that. Um, but he hadn't really joined quite yet. Uh, still kind of, you know, checking things out, I guess. But one person that he meets in particular is a guy named Tim Buck, who was uh, the leader of the Communist Party of Canada for a really long time. And a really amazing character like um he went to prison and uh spoke about like how incarceration is bad and uh he filled like massive crowds of, of people but he also spoke at churches like he was an atheist uh but he you know spoke at several churches that would have him and uh didn't seem to have like a brutal uh allergic reaction to christianity in general so uh they hit it off and became friends uh later on but uh eventually when he was 53 years old he decided to join the Communist Party in 1925. Uh, so there's this kind of short, uh, intense period, you know, from 1923 um, when he gets there in Toronto to 25, where he finally commits to joining the Communist Party, even though only two years earlier, um, you know, they were suspicious of him even arriving in Toronto. Yep. So one more one more conversion in the books for him. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, on that conversion... Uh, A.E. Smith says, In communism, I found the basic movement which would steadily grow into the agency by which the workers and all humankind would be released from economic and political bondage, from ignorance and disease, the broad movement which would eventually bring forth the true nature and spirit of people in a classless society, a firm conscious brotherhood over all the earth. Okay, well that, probably a little bit uh, idealistic <laughs> there, but... 
but all right. Spoken like a true pastor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, I mean, like, yeah. you know, it's communism is good, but, you know, you know it's a little bit uh, <laughs> overstated. <laughs> Uh, it is funny how these things really radicalize a lot of his positions. Uh, I mean, they obviously radicalize his labor positions, but they also radicalize even his strategic positions. Um, he'd been reticent to talk, for example, about violent revolution in the past, uh, especially in Brandon. Um, but at the same time, once he becomes a communist, he's more open to it. Uh, I think, you know, also noting the uh, affinity between the CPC um and like the soviet union for example and just getting closer and closer to the kind of bolshevik uh wave uh crashing over um canada and the u.s i think that um you know he he finally slowly kind of adopts a lot of those positions yeah exactly um and uh just like uh when people got mad at him and his church for saying things they didn't like um a lot of people he worked with in toronto uh did not like that he became a communist uh this like the the brief period when he was in toronto to when he becomes a communist he was working with like the labor movement in toronto and uh they thought that uh he was great but uh being a communist was like too much for them so they kind of uh you know pushed him out a little bit but didn't stop him he just kept on being a communist (laughs) <laughs> he also the party actually gave him a, a paying job uh which was like a more stable job than he'd ha- even have uh being a pastor so um in that sense like it was kind of a, a win-win both ideologically but also just like you know in his regular everyday life uh it was good that he was part of the party <laughs> yeah exactly well so um, he lost all these other friends but got a job out of it so congrats congrats uh congrats on that new job of being uh, in the communist party uh, so you might be wondering right now, okay, so it's great. He's a communist now. He's in the party. That's cool. But what happened to that dang cool church he was a part of? Um, nothing good, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, so back in Brandon, where the first People's Church is planted, when Smith went to the strike and all the workers and, and him you know, made up this uh, cool new church, uh, he ends up leaving that church in the care of this woman named Beatrice Bridgen. Uh, and she seems to do a lot of cool stuff. Like, I don't know, she keeps the, the kind of labor focus really going and that's cool. Uh, but over time, there are lots and lots of communists that start coming and bringing their families to the church, which you would think would be awesome. Uh, and at first she sort of, uh, seems to be kind of okay with it, but not exactly. So the article explains, uh, Bridget had the impression that these communists thought they could take the church over. However, she explained that they caused no trouble. The fact was that most people were not particularly fond of them. Not too surprising, because the labor movement doesn't always like communists. Um, and uh, I guess the RCMP also sort of uh, confirms this. Like Some, some uh, records from the police suggest that the church had slowly become more sympathetic to communism. Uh, but also, you know, it doesn't seem to be the case that it was fully there. Uh, fully like a communist church by any stretch. Um, and that suspicion is confirmed when uh, there's a report uh, based on an, an interview with her um, where uh, it says in 1924, the communists attempted to gain control of the church. And rather than have that happen, Bridgen closed it down. That is, that is such peak church drama. It really is. Uh, it is the biggest bummer. Like, imagine a bunch of communists showing up in your church and like bringing their families and uh, like... I mean, why would you think that, first of all, why would you think that they're taking it over? But secondly, why wouldn't you really want them to? (laughs) Like, it's all these people who are just volunteering to, like, do a lot of work, I guess, which is not the kind of thing that churches usually complain about. Um, I don't really know what the shape of the, uh, you know, the people's church was like at that point. But, like, to just shut it down instead of just moving and starting a a different kind of labor church or something seems, like, super petty. Yeah, it really does seem pretty petty. I think about all the times... Uh, in my church experience, people are just like, man, we just really need volunteers, but, you know, no one wants to do anything. <laughs> and here are people, but, uh, nope, wrong people. People who are literally trained in how to do stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. <laughs> that sucks for um, that church. That's a bummer. But, I mean, Christians gonna Christians are going to exclude uh, people who want to steal their power. That's the thing they do. It's true. Uh, It's too bad the church didn't follow uh, Smith's own trajectory. Uh, 
Uh, well, maybe we can kind of wrap up this conversation a bit with some closing reflections. Uh, I should note, um, one thing we couldn't fully determine is really whether or not Smith is, like, a Christian at the end of his life when he's a member of the Communist Party. Uh, he wrote an autobiography that I haven't been able to get a hold of, but hopefully sometime soon we'll be able to, and maybe he says more about it there. Uh, but all signs point to uh, the notion that at least if he was a Christian, it's definitely a kind of naturalist, like um, maybe liberal Protestant view of Christianity. Uh, you know, not not the kind of evangelical Christianity that would have characterized him maybe when he was younger. Uh, but nevertheless, um, he does he doesn't seem to ever have uh, like bad feelings toward his own Christianity or his Christian past, like seems to kind of reflect on it with a, you know, based on excerpts and stuff with a kind of um, appreciation for where it got him or whatever. And uh, so I'm curious, Matt, to hear about uh, where that journey of his got you. Uh, anything that really sort of stuck out about his own transition from being this evangelical Christian to being, uh, you know, maybe Christian, but definitely communist guy. Yeah, well, um, I mean, at the beginning of this episode, I said, like, you know, I kind of like identify with him a little bit like that his his life experience is definitely things i feel like i've felt and gone through i feel like at the end uh i mean i guess i'm probably more of a christian than he was uh supposing that what you said is the case i don't know um but it's like a a pretty cool life story to kind of see unfold and i mean i suppose like we have the privilege of like looking back on it from far in the future when he existed um but uh it's a cool story it's like it's one more of those like untold uh histories of leftist christianity that i think we need to know about yeah for sure and i think that's what really attracted me to learning about him as well i mean not just because i like the communist party of canada and happen to be a christian but also just because it illuminates a side of history that people like willfully forget um and also that like let's face it, the governments of the United States and Canada have actively tried to make people forget. Like, yeah. that's not a conspiratorial thing. Both the Communist Party of the USA and the Communist Party of Canada were illegal uh, for a very long time. And, I mean, there was a concerted effort to shut down any memory of people like Smith uh, and his, you know, friends and, and narrative, let alone to suggest that, like, a pastor might have become a communist at some point. Yeah. Um, so those stories are just important to keep reminding ourselves too that like, you know, there was a time in history when like being a socialist and a Christian was hard, but you could like make a whole church out of it. Uh, <laughs> and there's like no reason that that can't happen now. If, you know, we think really hard about what it means to organize in that way. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's wrap this conversation up with uh, one more quote from uh, one of the articles we read. Uh, okay, so the author of the article says, His eventual decision to join the Communist Party, though not inevitable, is unsurprising. Throughout his career, Smith was incapable of embracing a worldview that did not promise an end to history and the triumph of the oppressed. So, uh, I hope that those kinds of things can be said about the rest of us someday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I really want to be incapable of embracing a worldview that doesn't promise those things. Yeah, I think it's good. I think it's good to embrace that type of worldview. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to The Magnificast. If you like this episode, you can go support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash The Magnificast. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter, uh, twitter.com slash The Magnificast. Uh, we're on Facebook, and uh, that's it for social media. That's all. Um, if you, uh, want to buy some things from us, uh, we have like communist stickers and some t-shirts and some, and a poster. You can go to redbubble.com slash shop slash the Magnificast and you can get all that good communist swag to put on your laptop and like freak out your friends. It's good though. And they're not that expensive. So you can go do that or not like whatever you want to do. Um, cool. Uh, we're also part of some... Uh, cool podcast networks. One's called Theology Corner and one's called Critical Mediations. There's a bunch of other good podcasts on all of those networks and you should go listen to them all right now immediately. Uh, Revolutionary Re Left Radio um, is a cool one that's on Critical Mediations. They just came out with this really great episode about the uh, Spanish Civil War and uh, you gotta listen to it. It's very good. They spent some time putting it together. If you listen to it, dude, 
I haven't, but I'm meaning to. There's lots of Christians involved in the Spanish Civil War, so I'm really curious about learning more about that history. Yeah, well, it's cool. So check it out. Cool. Uh, see you next time. Between us and our Lord. Jackson, keep your hoods up. Well, you keep your hoods up and you stay up late. Jackson, you keep your hoods up. Well, you keep your hoods up and you stay up late. Oh, don't mind a cold night, but might mind if you leave too soon. So come on now, it's still early. At least I would else are you gonna do? As we kissed in the alley by the Michigan theater, fall snow was blowing in the lights of the downtown. Saw a spark in your eyes, I just spoke it. Said we're gonna turn this whole place upside down.